Well, this set is going back and forth. Game three goes to the Poppies. And this one, probably the most methodical we have seen yet today. Gormizer, I, I think you look at what just happened, and that is a, a small lead yeah. that became a slightly bigger lead, and they just clean it up at the end. The Poppies planted a seed early on. They okay. go to solo lane. They send pretty much everyone over there. Yeah. And they say, cool, here's a little seedling. <laughs> and then they just watered it until it flourished into right. a beautiful plant. I mean, it was exactly what you want from a Smite game. Yep. Like, they get to the point where it was a 2-1 early on, then it becomes a 5-1, then it becomes an 11-1. And, like, they just right. stacked on, stacked on, stacked their kills to the point where they were so far ahead. The last time I wrote it down was about 11K gold 24 minutes in. Right. That it felt like they were not necessarily untouchable, but... Sure. So in control of the pace of the game that Picarine Noobs needed something huge and breakout to happen, and they just couldn't get there. Well, I mean, you look at the uh, the post game stats. Marcus feeding out of his mind for the Poppies, the one death. Can't believe it, dude. For him. <laughs> it's hard, I think, get to him maybe out highlight. Yeah, get get him out. Bench him for the next game. Uh, the Poppies. I think it's maybe hard, but maybe not so hard to highlight a few of the the important guys there. I, I agree with Agro. I think Draco Marino on this Kepri had a great game. Yeah, I mean. The saves came in clutch so often. And the biggest thing about it, and, and Agro made this point perfectly, and so did Finch, where it's just he's been playing very aggressive on aggressive style yeah. gods. Mm -hmm. And that game, he got to play aggressive on Kepri while also being able to save his teammates. Like, it just opened up the door a lot more for him to, or for his team specifically, to not necessarily play sloppier, but they could take more risky engagements because they have wow. that second life now. Yep. And, uh, you know, Scylla, I think, is maybe in an interesting spot. Some analysis during the game. I mean, she, she's not maybe in that conversation of like the best mid lane gods yeah. at the moment, but it worked out here for the Poppies. I will say, yeah, I'm going to echo what Agro said sure. at the beginning of that game was that Scylla does one thing really well, and that's damage. That's pretty much all she does. And you know what? She did this that. game, she got to do damage. <laughs> it didn't really matter that she couldn't do the rest of the stuff because she didn't need to. She just had to set up, be there for kills. Crush does a lot of damage. Sick them in the once it's fully leveled is one of the best abilities you can have. And again, I'm a monster, especially if it's used maybe a little more haphazardly, is yep. perfect for either CC immunity or just a little chunk of burst damage. And if you're lucky enough to find yourself in a position, maybe you get that, you know, juicy quadra kill you find the resets on right. something it's fun when it happens that way well well marcus on that hoon bats you know despite the one death oh, blemishing yeah. big his kda big at the end there to close out that game uh izanami we, we you sort of mentioned during picks and bans mm -hmm. that with the Scylla and the iza maybe you're looking more towards late game i think warchi played early game into mid game into yep. late game perfectly warchi played the curve that he needed to yep. and he was on it the entire way until eventually again especially with draco playing the way he did on the kepri behind him warchi had no concerns in the world sure. he was very comfortable in it that's probably something that comes from having a duo lane this long how many years they've been playing together they feel comfortable with each other that izanami was top damage i believe if i saw the if i remember the stats correctly so she was able to do so much in those games good rotations and like you said early game controlled the lane into mid game late game fights was making sure to dictate the pace of it i agree in game two or game three rather the picks and bans for game three were kind of that first pivot away from the Giannis and the kukul khan moving into the Scylla and the merlin matchup so big swing from what we had seen in the mid lane. I wonder if maybe these two teams continue to try to pivot things around. Uh, but, but I was questioning sort of, you know, you, you get first pick and you were saying there's three gods that I maybe warrant that first pick. Yeah. You have to give a couple away. Kamazot's very good spot. And I think in that last game, yeah. either warrants a ban or shows why you should be first picking it. And I'm wondering if Pikari Noobs are going to go back. I mean, they first picked it. Then they lost sure. it the first pick. Now I'm wondering, since they are first pick, they get this, this swap back over there. If that might be on their mind to try and scoop that up. And where you put it and maybe the, the curve of it again. I keep right. using the curve of the game, but it's just such a good applicable a term curve, for yeah. how well you pace yourself into that. I mean, that game, the last one, was a real even one up until about 16 minutes. Right. Even though Poppy's had a pretty decent lead or a small lead that they had been cultivating for those first 16, it was back, around go. like 16, oh. 17, 18 that they were like, okay, this is ours now. Yep. And I think Odin cements himself in that conversation first pick here for the Peter Renews. Like Persephone, Morrigan, 
Nothing to be surprised about there. Uh, Kamazot's taken off the table, and Kukul Khan as well is off the board. It had been kind of Yanis and Kukul Khan, as I've mentioned a couple of times, so <laughs> Yanis still available. Would you be surprised yeah. if one of the two teams goes towards him this time? I feel like whoever does, like, I'm not surprised if one of them picks him. I'd be surprised if they grab him first. Right? <laughs> yeah, I hope if not, they right. say, yes, I want Yanis, yeah. and then the other team is then like, okay, cool, now what do we go? Mm -hmm. I feel like one will Lightning look for maybe bolt. a different mid laner, Merlin, mm -hmm. for example, and then Yanis starts to enter the equation of the conversation. Well, Poppy's grabbed that Kukul, and remember, he was technically in that Guardian uh, support oh, role in game oh. two that they lost right towards the end when Pika Renoobs were able to turn things around about 35 or so minutes in. And they're going to go back to the Kukul in here. They do have a Shing Chin this time, though. Yeah. So maybe that more so seems like solo lane Kukul. Definitely feels like it. Feels Shin like it. It's hard to say, right? There as well. right? So it's one of those things that it's like, this theoretically works. Might be able to. Yeah, it's hard to say. Absolutely able to switch it. Predict up. the I future, Gore. The best way. Not going to do that <laughs> one. But the best thing about it is you could send either of them to the long lane with yeah. that Izanami, and you're feeling fine. I mean, That's right. as long as you have Warchi do what he did last game again, it's going to work out perfectly. It's just whether or not he can do it without the Kepri now, that is the biggest question. Izanami looked really good because there were a lot of times where he could get saved My from maybe, not necessarily mispositioning, All but something going set. wrong for him. Now he doesn't have that. If Xing Chen's there, you can peel, but you don't have as much. A quick update. Thor, Daji, Awilish, Kumbakarna round out the final four bands for both teams here. Set, though, picked yeah. up for the poppies here, and that's something we saw Sino, I think, have a world of success yesterday oh, yes. in the jungle with that set. If I remember correctly, everyone on Twitter was just saying, retweeting the clip saying, you don't give Sino set. Yeah. And if you can live up to that kind of expectation, it shows what he can do in the jungle, though. It's right. a lot of control in a fight. He can go perfect for those picks into the back line. It's just, again, making it work in the right order and, again, yep. riding the curve that they did last game. Well, Gormizer, it's another Scylla locked in here. I, I can hear Finch and Agro having a conversation about it right now. I'm sure that's another talking point mm. we'll bring up. What do you see him uh, a bit unsure about here, though? I don't know how well it fits against Pika Renoobs this game around. There's a sure. lot more to maybe lock her down. She's going to have yep. to use yeah. her <laughs> maybe more defensively this right. game than offensively. And Poppies, like, if they are able to get ahead of the curve and, and start fighting the way they want to on their terms, absolutely. But Sobek, especially once he starts rotating over, is going to be able to make that still a bait for his Merlin. And the Habwa in the jungle more than likely coming around. Yeah, do you him. like that? That is deadly in yeah. the right hands. That's going to be an interesting matchup against the set. I'm actually really excited to see how that one works. Is that where you think that this matchup hinges on, kind of the set Hebo, whoever's able to make the most impact? Definitely as the game goes on. Sure. Habwa is going to he, he's going to need the items, right. I think, to match up. Scylla is like, essentially, they're, they're on the same kind of power curve. Once you hit late game, you're going to two-tap someone. It's yep. just when you can get to that point. So I'd keep my eyes on the jungle for Pika Renoobs to see if they can do it. We're moving into game four. Poppies, they could end the set right here. Finch, are they going to do it? Poppies have a really good chance, man. They just look have, they look so strong throughout this set. And Pika Renoobs looked a bit like they were waning last game, just yep. from what I was seeing. And like you said, it, it was the weakest performance we've seen from them yet. But... I do kind of like their draft. I mean, they've got Merlin, Heimdall, they've got this Odin that everyone talks about how strong it is lately, Habwa in the jungle. I don't super love Sobek support anymore. He feels a bit old to me, but still, this is a good draft they've got. I agree. I mean, they do have the Odin, but at the same time, Poppy's have five gods that get out of Odin Cage. That, yep. that is, that without damage, though, that probably won't be a thing. Of course, that does matter these days is the ability to break out the enemy team and not just if they can keep, jump out because they still will take damage but i don't know i, I just think that the poppy's draft is really on how well draco is going to play the shing chen because sure. draco was the the difference maker last game in my mind with that kepri how well can he do it again on the shing chen i think it sets up better for Scylla a lot of the time because it groups up multiple people it's possible to grab backliners and not just frontliners like you often do with the Kepri. So there's certainly wombo combo potential. You don't even need Chekio there necessarily. A, a spectral projection and a dark portal together will certainly do the job for you a lot of the time, but I don't know. I, I, I just think that Draco's going to be the, the X factor here. 
Draco's going to be big. I think these junglers are going to be big, too, because normally, you know, when we talk about set, set jungle, the reason we don't like it is because it feels like it takes them a while to come online. Like, how long can you go without a jungler, basically? But Hawbaugh can take some time sometimes, too, to kind of get into his stride. Yep. How, do you, how do you see the, 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 this jungle matchup kind of panning out? I, I think that with the way that Sino played the set jungle yesterday, I think that a lot of players should really be trying to emulate exactly that in the way that he plays it. But that style doesn't work nearly as well against the Hebo in comparison to something like Hot Bats or even Thor or something like that, where that upgraded shell pickup at level 12 gives him such great all-in potential. Against Hebo, that doesn't really help you that much. I mean, right. the block stacks don't matter. That extra little bit of HP probably won't be the difference maker. I wonder if Marcus is going to go with that style or if he's going to be forced into that Aegis, which I think is a pretty big deal in this matchup. Rapio's got great damage potential. I think I'd like to see him go with the, with a Bancroft's Talon outside of that tiny, tiny trinket that he started with because that gives him the potential to get low and then immediately give that huge boost of power and lifesteal and flatten Marcus with a crushing wave. It's going to be a big deal, right? Just which one of them starts to come online first who's having a little bit more of that impact because when things get late, both of these junglers are going to be potent, right? We're not going to yes. worry about that. Exactly. And, and a big reason why Set's able to out-trade a lot of other physical assassins in the late game is because of Sandstorm. It gives you physical mitigation. And because that upgraded shell that Sino was going for, that gives him the ability to keep his DPS output high. Yep. But those block stacks are more relevant there. And late game assassins have burst, but not Hebo level burst. Up against a magical damage dealer, it's a little bit harder for this Sandstorm to really matter because, it's, well, again, only physical damage, 15% on that reduction. So it's really got to be Davey that has to be very worried about where the set is. But I talked about this yesterday when it comes to Heimdall. I think he peels Assassins off himself very, very well. Yeah. Between that Gallarhorn knockback from the two, using that Bifrost effectively to get away, and the outright damage you can just put out by using that Through the Realms Ultimate as an offensive tool instead of a defensive tool. I think it might be tough for Marcus in this game. I, I, I don't think I'd be very happy with my position if I were him. It's going to be tough. Marcus is going to have to make sure that he's executing at a really high level. Another thing to keep an eye on, though, is is this Scylla going to have quite the same level of setup as she had before? I mean, I know you mentioned that the best case scenario for a Xing Chen ult is really high, but I think the variance is a lot wider, right? That top end is good, but all the, all sure. the range in between is going to be a lot less consistent. Uh, I agree with you, but... I think that Xing Chen is, I, I'd say Xing Chen is the strongest guardian in the game right now. So sure. I think that from outright power level alone, you aren't upset about getting the Xing Chen. And you took it away from Mazega, who played it a lot earlier on, and, and forced him onto a Sobek pick that I agree with what you were saying earlier, feels a little bit outdated at times. So. Yeah. It's and plus, mazinga has been a bit risky sometimes, right? Sure. Sobek is the kind of god where that can really get punished. Exactly. It's very easy to punish him. We will be able to grab one with the Whirlwind of Rage and Steel. I spoke too soon. Davey with the delayed feeds does manage to avoid getting pulled. Nice little buy for Frost, uh, more for style than anything, but he does make it out of there, but it costs the beat. That's all that Draco won in that instance. Good dash away from Azega. He would have probably preferred to pick up the Sobek because that's a guaranteed kill pretty much, though Warchi has him back to base, so maybe they would have been a little bit damage light in that instance. You can fall a little bit short in moments like that, even if you have the full combo of Spectral Projection and Dark Portal ready to go. I don't know if he would have had the damage anyway. So getting beads is basically best case scenario. I'd argue so. And that does, in a lot of cases, make the Heimdall a lot less safe, right, without having the ult. Oh, yeah. Uh, he does have the CC immunity on the ultimate, which we saw used, I think, by Davey earlier on in this set quite well with, with the timing of the Unbots and the Fear No Evil. So certainly Davey is someone that can use that ultimate well to remaneuver when he needs to. But you just, on someone like on Heimdall, you really want to have those beads available. Definitely. I mean, it's such a it's such a big cooldown, and you can't really react like you can with Sobek Dash. Bifrost can get you to a different area very quickly, but is it going to be fast enough to stop getting picked up from a Xing Chen? Probably not. And this is something that's worth noting about Heimdall, by the way, as well. Any, C any hard CC resets your portal timer on when it's closing around you. Yeah. That includes the knockup from Xing Chen and the root from Xing Chen. So if you're almost about to transport and then you get knocked up or, or even just the second half and rooted, it's going to stop you from going through that. So that's something that Davey has to be very, very wary of in this game. 
And the more you talk about it, the more it sounds like Davey's kind of the target if you're on the side of the Poppies, right? That Marcus sure. has a good matchup there. So does Drake on Marino. So really, there's going to be so much on to Davey about how well he can avoid some of this extra pressure. I don't know that I'd say that he has a, that Marcus has a good matchup against Davey. I think that's the only one that he doesn't have a bad matchup against, necessarily. <laughs> well, this is exactly what we were worried about with Mazega, isn't it? Blink into charge prey finding nothing that forced him to also expend the lurking in the waters and that makes him a much better target lurking in the waters is a good tool to avoid the whirlwind of rage and steal yep. but without that now mazega's probably a prime target oh easily and draco just kind of watches him whiz by and miss <laughs> sweet that's uh that's exactly what i'm going to be going for surprised that draco isn't playing up on that corner right there and just blinking in and immediately using that whirlwind no boots for Draco, though, is worth noting, so he doesn't have the movement speed to really close that gap. Very effectively, he went with that gauntlet of Thieves Rush, so maybe a little bit of a slower start for him at mid. And, and, you know, we were doing all this talk about Davey and how, how he could end up being a focal point in this game. I mean, it's worth talking a bit about his history because there was a while where he was kind of Vaporish Coast like, right? Sure. Over there in, in rival Xbox where, or, or EU Xbox, where they came from. But I think he shed that title and started playing well in his own right as Rapio has to use the beads to get away from the Whirlwind of Rage and Steel. Warchi, though, being ganked by Picarino on the Merlin. It's working well. They find first blood on a Warchi. Easy kill right there. And that Heimdall has a great counter matchup against Izanami because of his ability to see through that stealth. He yep. can communicate that very easily. And now Mazega in no man's land. You might be thinking, well, he's out lurking in the waters, right? No. That's going cooldown, and Marcus gets a nice return kill. And what's best case scenario? That if he hits that pluck. No idea. That he dies closer to his tower. <laughs> that, that's best case scenario. Set tries to stick on top of Raphael on the hop wah. Like him using the clone there, trying to find some turnaround potential. But even low on mana, Raphael makes it out. And now Davey going to catch Marcus. Perfect. And Picarino gets the kill. I guess he earned that one. But really, Davey's the one that cut it off. Ooh, good. I'm a monster, yeah. though. Coming from Czechia will at least get something on the board for the poppies. But... That, that Hebo matchup for Set can be very difficult. Not only that lack of magical reduction on the Sandstorm, but Set kills you by slowing you. Yes. And Hebo doesn't get slowed. As long as he has his two up, it's very easy for him to just walk out, just like we saw. Zega might be looking to right some past wrongs. They can catch out this Kakulin of Creed beyond the Tier 1. We don't need the charge prey there. We get the kill either way, thanks to overpowered USB. Covering the out. You know, right. That's, uh, y you force him back right there. That's smart. I use my ultimate for that usually, but certainly charge prey works there. Whichever tool you need to get the job done. Pika Renoobs holding on against Poppies here throughout this early game so far. Three kills in their favor. Little bit of the gold favoring them too, but things are pretty close so far as another charge prey off the mark. I mean, this was a bit of my concern coming into it. Sobek is not only a bit old in that he doesn't do as much as some new gods do, but you really got to hit charge prey to get value out of him. Yeah, uh, I, we, I think that's 0 for 4 so far, so we'll see if that uh, continues for Mazega. Certainly needs to find a home with those. You're, you're not picking Sobek to, uh, for, the, for, the knock, for the knockback on the two. But the good news is he doesn't seem afraid to take the shot, right? And that's something that you really yep. need from your Sobek players, is that when they think that that window is there, you really got to be willing to go in, grab it, and even get that set up for their team, because that displacement sometimes really can just be a free 5 before advantage for your team. Completely agree. Got to gotta keep your foot on the gas, yep. even if you already crashed into the into the barrier, <laughs> so to speak, right. if you're, if you're Sobek. You're not, you're not playing Sobek to dash away every single time. You've got to use that initiation where you can. So far, that's been the case. We've sat on Mazega here for a bit, so we'll give him a moment. Instead, we'll come back and talk a bit about these mid-builds once again. It's Karen's coin early for Cecchio this time, but Picarino is still sitting on the restored artifact. He's moved on and started working on his flat pin option there instead. Do you like this build path from him? Yeah, we saw him do this last game as well. This is a game where Divine looks phenomenal. Yep. Up against all this HP 5 from Draco. You know warchi has got Blood Forge. Marcus is going to heal a lot in that Kingslayer ultimate. Again, Merlin great at applying it. And as I fit, say, all those reasons why Divine would be great, he finishes the Spear of Desolation. <laughs> Doesn't need it, I suppose. Well, don't worry. Czechia will pick one up, as we saw last time. USB working together with Raphia, though. They flatten Creed over in the solo lane. Hobwa ganks can be strong, man. This is why we see Hobwa in the jungle sometimes. He can be good there. It's very hard to just itemize against it, because you need physical protection against your lane opponent. Yep. And then Hobwa comes in and does true damage to you very early on in the game. And that was with Creed having that ward shield get, building into a runic, most likely, I would guess. So he even had a little bit of magical protection. That's never going to be enough against a Hebo. That's tough. 
a lot of damage that's coming towards him via Rapio and overpowered USB. Davey taking the battle, but as soon as that steroid comes out, you got to back up up against the Izanami, man. It's so yeah. such a potent tool. It's interesting because I, I would think that this is a very Heimdall-heavy matchup where, so where you would really give him the edge because Warchi can't sneak up on you. You can't really use that escape effectively. It's really only a distance tool that stealth is virtually worthless. But Heimdall really wants to initiate combat by walking at you, channeling Gallarhorn to slow you down, and then he just hits harder than you after that. That isn't always true against Izanami. She's going to hit really, really hard when she pops that sickle strike. And so that's a good opportunity to stand your ground and fight. Maybe this matchup isn't as bad for Izanami as I thought. It's an interesting take on a way to fight against Heimdall, where he usually puts himself in a very good position to play aggressively. I do like the way we saw Davy just use that extended vision just now, though, to kind of check that Gold Fury pit, see if there was maybe a cheeky Gold Fury happening or what was going on with the Oracles, which is what they were actually there for. These are the kind of extra ways that I think you have to use Heimdall to really get the max value. I know that the two is gigantic and you're just going to take a bunch of free damage from him. That's what everyone thinks about. And his autos hit for a million. But I think effectively using Five Frost and effectively using an extra vision, those are those real extra areas where I think our pro players are going to show what Heimdall can really do. And you have to be able to communicate where you see everybody once they walk past a ward. Yep. Use your pings consistently. You just try and communicate that to your team whatever way you can. That's going to be a huge deal for Heimdall players. I don't think that's a god where you can stay silent in the comms a lot of the time. You're the only one who gets that information. Rapio was waiting over here for a long time, so he has to commit Crushing Wave. Not quite sure if it connected, but I don't think they need it either way. They get the kill as Creed falls, but that's going to leave USB stuck underneath the tower, getting pulled back in by Draco Marino. What a good rotation. But coming over is Mazega as well. They might be able to keep this chase going. I'm a monster. Buy some time. Can't quite find the hit, so Mazega should be able to keep on running. No reason to try and turn and burn this, though. Maybe with Picarino on the way, there's a little bit more of an opportunity, but this wise decision to start backing up. Draco's a full health Shing Chen. We're not killing him. Agro, talk to me a bit about when, as the mid laner, you can look for some of those rotations. Because Picarino had one earlier on in this game for a kill in left lane. He just rotated over to solo. That is hard, a hard timing to find. It is, but look at the minimap right now. No mid camps up. That's a huge deal. Red buff was down. Back harpies are down. You don't need to be making that rotation if there's farm in the mid lane, number one. Clear your wave, first and foremost. And then if mid harpies are up, those are usually priority. Now, there are times where you have to say, okay, I, I'm needed at this fight. I can't afford to, to spend time to get red or, or get my mid camps. But the general rule of thumb is if there's farm on the map, you need to take it. And then you can go and try and make a play in one of the side lanes. That is a, that, that's a huge part of mid lane is really maximizing your uh, effective farm before you make these rotations. It's true for every lane, but mid lane has so many more options because you can go either side yep. that it seems a little bit more tempting in that role than it does in others. But for the most part, if mid camps are up, we're getting those. If backs are up, those might be worth getting. How, how likely is that rotation to actually pay off is a big, is a big part of it as well. I think Picaruto has found that balance so far, at least throughout these first 15 minutes here in this game on that Merlin. It can be difficult to, 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 to make that decision, especially because you're so reliant on, on Flicker being like your escape path. You don't want to be using that to help move around faster too often. Got to make sure you're doing all that stuff properly as Chekio waits around the corner with that extra Heimdall vision being communicated, but didn't find a whole lot. But this fight's going to kick off. Mazega, as always, is right in the thick of things. That's forced the Poppies to back off, at least for now, though he did have to commit the Lurking in the Waters. And the Blink. So now, if you're Draco Marino, we're immediately looking for a Blink Ultimate and he finds at least two. It does find Picarino to bring him back quite low. Flicker gets him back underneath the tier one, trying to rely on Creed to help keep members locked down, but there's not much more there. So Picarinoobs can start to fall back, hang out for a little bit. They know they can't rely on Mazegas quite as much of a front line as normal. Another penless build so far for Marcus. Transcendence into a hide of the urchin. How's he going to write? Not going to be easy. He's got a pencil at the very least. Ah, uh, maybe. It, Mechanical. It's easy to erase, and that's the, the real problem. Also, uh, never make that joke in front of me ever again. That was awful, wasn't it? It really yeah. wasn't good. And, and that's coming from me, so you know <laughs> that it's really not good enough. It, this Hide of the Urchin is going to let Marcus really start to snowball the game pretty effectively. But in my mind, what else snowballed, snowballs the game is your set getting a lot of damage and then 1v3-ing by himself. Urchin lets you do that in a different way, but I just don't know that this is... I don't know that you can build enough magical protection for it to matter against Tebow Merlin. 
is, is would be my <laughs> thought process. The only way that I survive their damage is by killing them really, really quickly. Merlin has so much prot shred. Hebo has so much outright base damage. It, I, I just don't think the prot's the right way to go about it, and personally. I, I think I would rather just see him go for the full damage. Go Hydra's in that slot, just like he did on Hunt Bats. Start auto-canceling your clones and, and just try and take them out before they can kill you. Well, are they, are they going to start needing some kind of anti-heal options here soon? I mean, look at the band cross into Typhon's route. I know we don't talk about Mage Life still that often because it doesn't work nearly as well as like on physicals. But sure. I think that Rapio is going to be keeping topped up a decent amount in this game. Absolutely. I, I actually have experimented with this build a decent amount on a lot of mages, and I think Hebo is certainly one that leverages it the best. This this band cross into Typhon's full healing. You can go a Pythax piece later on in this build. It sure. gives you 10% more pen and even more life steal. I think it's really, really good if the enemy team doesn't itemize into anti-heal. It's just that anti-heal is so prevalent that it really neuters your build as soon as they pick it up. I think that Chekio likely wasn't thinking anti-heal, neither was Marcus. But now, if you look at Rapio's build, I think it should be strongly considered for sure. Draco Marino trades the ults one for one, but they get Rapio uh -oh. coming back in their direction. This is still a decent fight for the Poppies here, perhaps. Checkio is so low way in the back line, and USB is just going to see if he can chase him down with this Gun Gears might. Does get some help coming his way in the form of Mazega, but Checkio has bought so much time for his team. Rapio finally gets that kill. They've even got one more member low. It's Warchi, and USB commits the die for it. Pika Renoobs starting to show up here in the mid game. Man, Finch, that should have been an easy fight for the Poppies, because that was a great ult from Drake. He chases Rapio down that yep. entire time and picks him up towards the very back end of that ultimate. Yep. Chekio misses the Sikkim and had that ultimate up. Didn't use either one, so Rapio is able to escape and it baits Chekio in a little bit further. I don't know if that was miscommunication or what, but that one in my mind drops to the feet of Chekio. That is a brutal fight that they've lost. Now Mark is taking a ton of damage from this Odin. This is, I think, the Odin that's starting to stalk the nightmares of some of our player base right now. When he's able to get a bit ahead of the map, level 17, and, and, and just threatens you to kill you in the 1v1, and you can't wow, kill him. This. But Fire Giant being started. Picarinums, they're using all this space bought by USB, and I don't think anyone on the Poppies either recognize it's happening or they can't make it in. That's the Fire Giant for Picarinums basically for free. They had no idea. They had no idea. Both both frontliners on Poppies are just messing around with USB on blue buff. Yeah. There's no way that's the call if you know the enemy team's on Fire Giant. That early Heimdall damage, man, is very relevant. He just hits really, really hard early on. Merlin's such a good character. Yep. It, setting up other magical damage dealers to do a lot of damage to objectives. Drop that fire stance too. Hebo's doing true damage to that thing, even without any pennant besides that 10% from Typhon's Fang. Good call from the from the Pika Renoobs. That, that was very, very heads up. And this is something I think that teams are going to have to start being worried about when they face Pika Renoobs. Because remember, everyone playing today is going on to the group stages. We've got the three weeks, I believe, of this open play that happens. And each week we're qualifying the semifinalists on into that group stage play. And Pika Renoobs have proven that they're very willing to start going for these risky objectives in these weird windows. Yep. Teams can't let that kind of sneak past them, I think, going forward. I, I completely agree. It's just something that whenever you're playing against these guys, think about it extra it, it's not always easy to do it's and not at it all falls by the wayside a lot of the time but something that's got to be in the back of your mind it was like playing against old enemy you had to realize yep. that could happen to you at a given time i think a lot of pro teams have really added that play to the repertoire very well but at this level it's usually specific teams that do it well and picarinoobs have certainly been one of them they'll grab a tier two tower for their trouble because there's Creed and Warchi kind of over and right trying to see if they can trade a tier two out for it. But I think that Picarinums have recognized this well. They're just gonna threaten this left side Phoenix and there's not a full defense in place from the Poppies and look how quickly it's being shredded. In comes the Whirlwind of Rage and Steel. Beads are committed for it, Ooh. but great job locking down Chekio. They get good poke in onto him. The DPS on the Phoenix has slowed down to about half HP. The Poppies have managed to set a defense. Dave, he's in a little bit of trouble though. He's pretty far forward right now, but seems to be willing to stand tall and fight even without any relic. This is getting risky. Yeah, Davey clearly feeling himself a bit, but now the Poppy's ready to move out beyond the Phoenix. They did get the tier two over and right, so so far this is fairly even, but Draco Marino pulled back in. There's the charge prey we were looking for. Draco Marino falls first. Marcus low two and Rapio completes the killing spree. Now they've got four and the Odin showing up to make it five to push into the Phoenix. This should be a left side Phoenix. Creed just isn't healthy enough to be an effective frontliner. 
for the, the defense here. You should just give this up and make yes. sure you don't lose the game. That's exactly right. You don't want to lose too much, and Warchi does get caught. Beads forced out from him as the left side Phoenix comes tumbling down. Fortunately for the Poppies there, Aggro, and I mean fortunately, they don't end up losing more on the back of that fight. I agree. Overpowered USP had the cage. What are we waiting for? <laughs> I mean, that, that was the time. If you can kill Warchi there, I think that's game over, but they just don't have enough. They, they could have gone for the end, but a lot of towers still on the map, a lot of damage still on the table for the Popeye, for the, for the Popeyes, for the Poppies. Getting lunch Yo, time, you want to you know? hit that? Yeah. I'm hungry, you know? That's how it is sometimes <laughs> out here. Poppies have a lot of damage between the Scylla and the, and the Izanami. Maybe it's just safer to back it up and get these towers. That's going to be the call, but Draco Marino, they want to take the fight after the Tier 2 goes down, and Rapio is so much of the damage to Pikarinu as he's been taken out. Creed, though, manages to get back out of the cage. Good job breaking that wall. This is a decent fight from the Poppy so far. They've got a pretty good chance, but look at all this regen for Pikarinu from that Fire Giant. They're USB's all plenty healthy. Up. Yeah, They're able to really stand and fight if they need to. Pikarinu's got plenty of damage still in the kit. I mean, he's got a lot of gold in hand, I imagine. So it doesn't have Soul Reaver yet. 3K. Yeah, 3,000. This should be just a, a full reset in my mind if you're Pika Renoobs. That's actually a great point. As far as this fight was concerned, really, Chekio was a bit ahead in terms of the build path at that point. So Pika Renu going to hit a really big spike, I think, off of this back. They've got the Fire Giant buff falling off right now, and then they'll head back over to the Fire Giant here in this next minute to try and fight it. Poppies, though, only down 5K. They did lose the furthest Phoenix. How do you feel about them coming out to contest this next FG? I mean... It's just not its not a horrible spot for them. I mean, it's only a 5K deficit. Right, but it's not a lot. At the same time, it's going to be kind of hard for them to consistently clear these waves. Are you sending Creed over there and then letting him TP in? He's going to have to use a lot of resources in order to get it done. So maybe you try and time a transformation from him on a, on a, in a play where you put a ward deep and try and get him behind Pikarini, who's already pre-transformed. That, that's kind of where I'd be looking, because you can't afford to let your... your Titan take this many fire waves. I'm not lying. I kind of forgot Kakullin was in this game. You talked about the transformation. I'm like, who are we caring about? <laughs> oh, you're right. Creed is in this game and just has not done a whole lot, has no. he? No. He, I mean, he got over, he overextended, got picked between the towers. Then Rapio came over, killed him again. Then they killed him again right <laughs> after that. I mean, he got taken out of this game pretty effectively. Yeah. It's not, I think there's a misconception on how you take players out of the game. It's usually not one kill. It's a kill followed immediately by a second kill that really does eliminate you from being a factor in the game. Well, it looks like the Poppies are not going to contest this Fire Giant. This will be the second uncontested Fire Giant that Pikarinu has gotten this game. It turns out that's typically a pretty good recipe for success here at this high level of competitive smite. So they'll be looking to take down this tier two tower and right. And then how do you want to see them split up this push in terms of threatening to break the base? Normally you've got a physical assassin, so they're very good at pushing these towers. That's not the case this time around for right. Pika Renoob. So a full five on five might be the call. Poppies have really been the initiators. Even on that left side Phoenix, there was Draco blinking in and looking for these, uh, these pulls off that ultimate. Wouldn't surprise me to just, w if Pikarino just wait and see if Poppies will continue to try and be the engagers, just hasn't gone well for them up until this point. But Marcus did just finish off his Blood Forge. That's a big power spike. Still exactly zero pet in the build for him. Mazega goes in, charge Prey, and I think he got the beads out from Chekio. That's exactly what he wanted. USB gets pulled back to the grab, but Marcus in the back line blown up. The knockups were there, and the set never really even gets to get started. Pikarinoobs are a bit low, but they're going to sustain back up with FG and try and make another surge. Just like I said, there's not enough protection in the world to save you from this amount of damage. <laughs> you may as well just wait for your opportunity, be a little bit more patient, and then go in there and try and find the, the 1v2s and 1v3s once some cooldowns are down. Marcus is a little bit too impatient on that initiation. One stack on that urchin, it's really not wor quite worth it at that level. USB has moved into the back line. He's got all the focus on him. Look how much space that this Odin's been able to buy for the team. Stuns out Warchi, even through the Aegis and Rapio right there to complete the kill. Right side Phoenix low and should be dropping now any second with the two Phoenixes down. I say that, left Phoenix back up. They can start to threaten this Titan right now if they want to take the 5v3. They should. I mean, Marcus is up in 10, but you still have ults for Davey and for overpowered USB. You can play it really safe with that left side Phoenix respawning, but I don't know. I think that this could have been an end. 
Greed has been caught out though, locked down and blown up. Raphael has the damage and the rest of the Kareen Oops have the CC. That should open up now this mid Phoenix. But remember, Marcus back up, does not quite have Kingslayer yet as Draco Marina goes to the back and grabs two. But the mid Phoenix burned down, Raphael ults forward and they're able to force Draco Marina all the way back to the fountain, all the way back to the base as they get the kill. One more has been caught by the Heimdall out. That's Marcus. He comes right back into the waiting grips of Pikarin Oops. Can't quite find the charge prey, but the Titans low. Half HP on that one, Mazega. One more death at the end, but that's the game for Pikarin Oops. We're going all the way to a game five. I mean, that, that game, it just felt like the poppies never meshed. Like, they got that huge yeah. game three win, and then they were like, all right, we cool, we won the set. And they go, wait, no, guys, it's a best of five. And they, they, you know, they're already in the shower or something like that. They get, they got to dry off real quick, run back to their computers. The, the comp didn't work nearly as well. Draco being your primary initiator on the Shing Chen did not work nearly as well. I thought no. Chekio did not look great on that Scylla. A lot of ultimates, again, right there at the very end. He picks up Rapio with the ult. Where's Chekio's I'm a monster? It wasn't there. Marcus did less damage than the Sobek, and Sobek hit one pluck all game. Yeah, that's not <laughs> that's not enough. You need a you need more from Marcus in that game. You need more from everybody. How could you ask for more though? The very first set of the day, we're going the full distance game number five, right on the other side of this short break.